Katrina, it's, I'm very pleased to be here with you today to talk about your new book. Can you please introduce yourself and sure. your book that yeah. is coming out soon? Yeah, so I'm Katrina Carcasis. I'm cultural anthropologist. I'm also an ethicist. And for the last 20 or so years, I've thought a lot about conceptualizations of sex, gender, and sexuality in medicine and science. And what is your new book about? And the new book is called Testosterone, an Unauthorized Biography. So it will be out in August of 2019 with Harvard University Press. So how testosterone is situated in your book? Yeah, so maybe it's better to tell you how the book came about. I have a long history of thinking about controversies over medical interventions for children with intersex variation. So basically children who are born with what are commonly thought of as male typical and female typical traits. And testosterone figured in those debates. And so in some ways I've been tracing this hormone for quite some time. And that led to a project around testosterone regulations in sport and really at the elite level, the desire to limit women's natural testosterone levels so that they could be eligible to compete in the female category. So basically a biological criterion used to label women as women. And if not, if they don't have the appropriate level, then they've been uh, excluded and banned from sport unless they lower it with medically unnecessary interventions. So it was during the course of that work that there was an interview that I had done with my co-author, Rebecca Jordan Young, who's also in New York. And we were on the BBC, and it was a short interview. And over the course of about 10 minutes, the interviewer asked three times, why testosterone levels were not a good way to divide men from women and why it was that they didn't confer a better athlete or better performance. And the first time she asked it, it seemed, you know, a perfectly fine question. By the third time she asked it, I didn't think that we weren't answering the question properly. I felt like we had hit up against a lot of folk ideology or folk wisdom about the hormone where what we were saying was hard to believe or hard to accept. And so from there, what we did was to write a book that essentially tried to deal with what I think of are a lot of sedimented ideas about this hormone. The idea that it's a sex hormone, that it's a male sex hormone, that it only affects sex traits, and that it results naturally based on people's levels, that higher levels result in particular behaviors behaviors very often coded as masculine, risk-taking, aggression, um, athleticism, things like that. And so what the book does is chapter by chapter look at these various domains of research and look at both not only what the research actually says, but how it is that narrative, folk wisdom about the hormone, ideas about gender and ideas about race shape not only what it is that the researchers understand about testosterone, but what they ignore or what they can't see around the hormone, even in their own research because of these ideas that are sort of commonly held. How your book is, uh, and your knowledge and analysis that you are yeah. presenting in the book is actually most relevant for recent political events. Yeah, you know, it's a really great question because on the one hand, there isn't necessarily anything in there where we say, well, there's a certain political event, you know, that's happened and it's been explained by testosterone. What instead is happening more pernicious and pervasive, which is really this idea that so many things that we understand to be naturalized. So for example, the dominance of men in particular hierarchies, the prevalence of men in STEM fields, the fact that prisons are mostly populated with men and mostly populated with black men, at least in the US, the idea that men take more risks. All of this can be tied back to the literature mm -hmm and to this hormone, which is just meant to do so much work in the world. And what our thought was, is if we can go back to the research 
and show what it actually says. And without giving away the punchline, let's just say that most things that people think this hormone does, it doesn't do, and it certainly mm -hmm. doesn't do in any clear and simple way. That if we could wipe that from the framework or the story, then we have a much deeper and, and sort of long-standing problem, which is if we can't use biology and testosterone to explain these sedimented social hierarchies, these inequalities, the way that women are second status in so many areas, are not understood to mm -hmm. take risks, mm -hmm. when, for example, childbearing is one of the riskiest activities that you can undertake, then we're left with a much more difficult problem, which is the social work, the political work, of undoing inequality because it's not natural, because it's socially created. And so that's the hope, is to turn our direction to that more difficult work, which will take um, significant efforts and time to revamp and undermine. So if you can have one takeaway message mm. for your book, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple, but I think one of the main ones or one of our hopes for this book is to really change in a way international conversation around this hormone and to start to have people question its connection to masculinity and why it is that certain ways of being in the world or certain behaviors like competitive drive, like athleticism, that not only would the hormone not be thought of as masculine, but the things that get attributed to this hormone not be understood as masculine so that they can be something that are traits shared among people and not the domain or the province simply of men, right? And so once we sever that, I think we're able to see all of the ways in which women have and use power, the ways that women are um, risk takers, but in ways that researchers don't understand to be risk taking because they've used masculinist frames. To, so to really sever that connection and to be more expansive and curious about what this hormone might contribute to that might even be things that we understand as feminine or feminizing. For example, we have a whole chapter on its relationship to ovulation. Mm -hmm. which is not understood yes. to be masculine at all, and yet testosterone is critical in that. And so to expand our knowledge of what it does in all different kinds of bodies, not just male bodies. Without taking the access away from those who may want to use it, right? Absolutely. They, within a gender binary, gender non-binary concept. Yeah. We are so eager of holding thank you. your book I'm in our hands. Too. We are very excited and thank, thank you so you. much for your contribution. Oh, Esther, I'm grateful to have the time to talk to you about it and for your interest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>